welcome uh, back uh, to uh, the uh, second part of the morning session. Uh, I just need to uh, give you two information concerning uh, the slight changes in the program. So please follow the marks on uh, the uh, uh, rooms uh, which are uh, to be our places where we are going to work uh, in the afternoon and uh, there are at the fourth floor the elevator is on our right uh, in any case we'll we'll guide you uh, for, for those who are not familiar with the faculty of humanities and the uh, second uh, uh, information is that we are going to have our lunch on the fourth floor uh, of the, this building and we will guide you as well so thank you for, for this and uh, uh, we will start uh, our discussion on money, the color, the taste, uh, form, and all other good and non good facts about money uh, with our guest uh, from the University of uh, Torino uh, and our friend Maurizio Ferrari <coughs> from the laboratory uh, for ontology, Labont. Uh, the founder of Labont uh, is Maurizio, and uh, Labont is now in good hands of Tiziana Andina. Uh, so, um, welcome back. I will not keep you any longer because you need to, to uh, rush uh, uh, to catch your train at Trieste. So, uh, Maurizio will uh, uh, give us a talk for about 20 to 20, 30 minutes, yes. 20 minutes, uh, and then we will have. Uh, uh, he, he's going to probably challenge uh, Searle's uh, <laughs> idea and the, the, the very idea of collective intentionality with the uh, concept of documentality, documentality, mm, you will tell us more about it. And after that, we are, uh, have, we are going to, to uh, hear John Searle's response if any, and uh, uh, we'll have questions and, uh, from, from the audience uh, as well, so we will um, end our work at probably 1, 1 p.m. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having, uh, uh, having the honor of having John Sir here. This is not a challenge. This is uh, just uh, a modest uh, integration, as uh, uh, we say in, in the hypocritical language of professor. But uh, really, I will try to uh, do all my job uh, in about 30 minutes, uh, because really, I should leave at 12. This will not be an excuse in order to escape John Searle's uh, uh, criticism. Uh, anyway, we'll meet in Paris the uh, day after tomorrow, so that uh, we can continue uh, in, this, uh, in this sense. Well, uh, I start uh, from uh, this canonical object. And uh, um, in uh, the interpretation uh, John gave us, uh, uh, this counts as 10 euros because we all believe that it counts as 10 euros. But uh, uh, what if, uh, but if we all decide in this room that this does not count as 10 euros, what happens? It still counts as 10 euros. Uh, in my eyes, this depends on the fact that there is uh, here written 10 euros and uh, what is written inside, in a sense, is more important than our intentionality. This is uh, the simple intuition I will try to develop in my presentation. And uh, in order to explain what is uh, my intuition, I will start uh, from uh, something slightly different from money, which is uh, Sagrada Familia. Sagrada Familia is a very complicated building which has uh, uh, something to do with some uh, intention and representation existing in the mind of uh, Gaudi, the architect that built uh, Sagrada Familia. In a sense, uh, we have a case of intelligent design. 
uh, I mean, uh, Gaudi has uh, some intuition and then uh, makes plans uh, and drawings uh, and then people build Sagrada Familia. Well, this is very simple and uh, in a sense uh, has something to do with intentionality, not collective in this case, but individual intentionality, which has after that uh, shared by plans uh, by people building the Sagrada Familia. Now, but we have another case, this one. This has uh, been uh, built by termites and uh, 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 we can call it maybe stupid design because termite has no plans about uh, uh, this building. They have uh, no representation in uh, 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 their minds. Uh, if you can speak about minds of termites, and nevertheless, uh, the result is uh, almost uh, the same. <laughs> uh, how so? Uh, we can speak about. Uh, a kind of emerging design, namely, no single termite had any idea about the final result, but uh, uh, the result emerged by a quantity of acts, in a sense, recorded, because after one act there is another, another, and the result is uh, the uh, insectal uh, Sagrada Familia. And uh, uh, I would suggest that the construction of social reality has much to do with emerging design than to with uh, uh, intelligent design. This also can explain why society is so stupid. Uh, the intelligent design, in a sense, uh, is uh, this of intentionality, which has been uh, so uh, uh, explicitly and brightly, brightly explained by John, also uh, in this uh, splendid conference lecture that uh, explained the, in uh, 45 minutes, and was really impressive, uh, a gigantic uh, uh, social thought. Uh, I, can, I have not to repeat uh, X count as Y and C, but uh, I observe that uh, uh, in order to have this, you need the notion of representation, something like uh, the idea of uh, Sagrada Familia in the mind of Gaudí, a declaration, something which is intentional, and we intentionally do, uh, and uh, I say, uh, Sanya is a uh, professor, I am not the authority, but uh, suppose that I am the authority of saying that uh, Sanya is a professor, uh, or Sanya is a goddess, no, but there may be uh, a higher authority, and, uh, and a construction. There is uh, a construction in social reality. In this sense, uh, there is a kind of uh, 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 double level in uh, John Searle's uh, uh, perspective. Uh, the nature is not constructed, is emerging, the society is constructed. What I try to do in order to, in a sense, fulfill the uh, naturalistic uh, uh, attitude of uh, John Searle is to explain that also social reality is not constructed but is emerging exactly like natural reality. And this is why I suggest this idea of an emerging design in, in society that I try to explain in this book, Documentality, much less famous than John's, in which I uh, suggested a different constitutive rule of uh, uh, social object. Object is a recorded act. What does it mean? means that imagine the description of speech acts in uh, Austin. Uh, uh, I say, do you want to marry? Yes, I do. Yes, I will. In this case, I construct an object. I'm not describing an object. Or I say, uh, uh, I give to the ship the name of uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth. I construct an object and not uh, uh, describe them, uh, a ship. What was uh, failing in uh, uh, Austin's description? 
the fact that he did not mind about recording. In fact, if we have not recording, then the social app disappear. Imagine that uh, the two people marrying without memory, without documents, and then the marriage disappeared. The name of the ship disappeared. The bet, I bet that two, uh, five shillings that the marriage will rain disappeared the bet, and uh, uh, everything disappeared in uh, social reality if we have not recording. Uh, moreover, uh, uh, we don't need uh, uh, a special kind of uh, intentionality in, do, in doing uh, uh, social acts. We simply need recording, the fact that the act is recorded. We need uh, action, we should perform some action. Those actions are not necessarily uh, uh, spoken action, I can shake hands in order to say that uh, I agree. And uh, uh, we need emergence. We need uh, a quite a lot of uh, uh, memory, social memory, uh, writing, archives, document that creates the emergence of uh, a social reality. This is in fact uh, uh, only a very small variant of uh, uh, John Searle's perspective that uh, underlines uh, how uh, irrelevant uh, at the very end is the intentionality, uh, 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 the active intentionality in the construction of social reality. The most we do in social reality acts without theories, uh, uh, intention, representation, and so on and so forth, is simply something that goes by default. Um, the fact that we need so much the recording, in uh, uh, mo much more recording than representation in society, is shown, for instance, by the fact that, that archives, writing, documents are so important in society even if we don't believe they are important. I uh, just take a simple uh, example in order to show that without any previous intention, uh, a device, a technical device, has become the most important technical device in the whole life because he has uh, a recording. Take uh, the cell phone. Uh, there's an originary cell phone that was able just to speak. Uh, one can say, well, it's perfect. It speak, what you ask for a phone is that it speaks, and that's all. But soon appeared writing, and then the possibility of creating documents, and recording. In the, there is a, a gigantic memory in this kind of device. And this is gigantic memory that makes those devices so powerful in uh, uh, the emerging of social reality. This is, by the way, is not uh, an archaic uh, uh, cell phone, it's a coffin uh, with the form of uh, with the shape of a cell phone in Ghana, which is uh, very interesting. One can answer uh, why to put himself in, in a cell phone, but for instance, there are people that uh, are, uh, have been buried with their cell phone, which was not for communicative purposes because they were dead, but uh, uh, it was uh, for recording purposes in order to have all the documents of their life uh, inside the, um, the, 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 the cell phone. Uh, so, uh, I would now try to do two moves. So, the, what, what I just, uh, the, the shift is let's consider uh, social reality something which is uh, emerging more than constructed, like happens in nature, and depends on recording much more than on intentions and representations. Uh, I would now try to uh, uh, explain that recording is the necessary condition of social reality, which in a sense is a very easy task, and then that is the sufficient condition 
of social reality, which is a very uneasy task. Uh, let's start from the easy task. For instance, it exists in France the institution of the posthumous marriage. Uh, you can marry someone uh, if you have some document proving that uh, the uh, dead uh, partner wanted to marry you. I, I don't see a special, any special advantage in the posthumous marriage except that it does not allow a posthumous divorce. Uh, I mean, you cannot di divorce uh, with uh, something you married in a posthumous war manner. But uh, now compare with the other example, marriage between amnesic. So, if uh, you have a recording, you can marry. If you have not recording, even uh, existing, living people cannot marry. Uh, and uh, again, think about the society without document self-recording. You cannot conceive the society. Uh, think about the society without uh, intentionality. You can still conceive the society because the intentionality is a result of the a recording instead of uh, a cause. I entered into uh, uh, the uh, difficult part of my task because uh, is it a sufficient condition? Suppose that uh, someone say, well, look, okay, this is the stock exchange. Uh, they have, of course, documents, but without the intentions in the mind of those people, uh, stock exchange will not work. Uh, is it really so? From an empirical point of view, it's not so, because uh, in the fact that it's uh, really uh, recently we read in the Wall Street Journal that, uh, for instance, a great uh, investment company uh, buried all its uh, human dependence and uh, it was uh, used by just a computer. Because, because the exchanges are so fast that they can be managed by computer and not by humans. You don't need to understand what you do in order to perform in social reality. But uh, the question, in a sense, is uh, where come from this idea of having an intentionality? And uh, in a sense, it's a chicken-egg problem, because uh, the answer is uh, Documents alone does not speak. They need uh, intention, human intention, in order that they can speak. But the counter answer is also humans alone cannot speak. Instead, they are trained, educated, uh, uh, they rise, reason in a culture, in a language, so that they are formed by documents and their own intentionality is created by documents. Of course, the problem is uh, that uh, what comes first, document or intention? I would say that, uh, I don't, not, not really uh, document, but the very real basis, the recording comes before the intention and produce the intention, not denying that intention exists, of course, we all have intentions, but I say that they are a derivation from a, a, a recording. Imagine a simple example, responsibility. Responsibility is a higher moral quality. But where comes from, for instance, responsibility? Is something innate in our spirit? Uh, this was the uh, idea of Kant, but I don't uh, uh, share this idea. Maybe it's uh, hidden in the need of responding also to something that comes from outside. Consider this a simple example. Or the uh, telephone. At the, in these uh, happy times, you can go out from uh, your home 12 hours long, for instance, and maybe for 12 hours the uh, bell was ringing, ringing, ringing. You come back at home, you have no responsibility at all because there are not re no recording. 
which is not the case now, because in this kind of device, we have the recording of uh, someone that called me, and this creates the need of uh, answer and hence the responsibility. It's a very basic tool that grows up from, uh, uh, say, something which is uh, uh, not intentional and creates something which is uh, intentional. In a sense, uh, all this kind of uh, document has to do with forms of recording that are determining for our collective intention, creating our collective intentionality because the collective intentionality is the result of sharing of document and uh, create also our individual intentionality. I, I cannot have uh, personal purposes outside a society. This means that the society and the structure precede my intention. It is not uh, depending in any sense uh, from my intention. Uh, so, one can say, why we have this uh, so evident need uh, and the intuition that uh, the society is uh, constructed by humans? This because when we speak about something we do in our life, I can decide, well, make a society, uh, make an institution, make... It. But this was valid for the origin of uh, society? Of course not. In a sense, uh, this uh, idea of uh, Rousseau, of uh, the uh, contrat social, the idea that people come together and decide that we will build a society, is unrealistic because, in fact, society was already there when people decided to do something like a, a republic, a state, who knows. Uh, why this need of construction in order to explain social reality? In a sense, as something similar uh, to, again, the intelligent design. design. Because, um, of course, uh, Constructivist view as born in an epoch in which people were convinced that the earth was no older than 10,000 years. If you believe that earth is no older than 10,000 years, then you should imagine that there is a transcendental ego that constructs uh, our experience, that there is a God that gives us a language, that there is a God that construct a society or people decide to construct a society. But if uh, we uh, uh, try to understand that the thing in a sense of the stupid design, we have plenty of time and plenty of material, then if we have time, we don't need construction. And uh, society has grown up in the time emerging and not being constructed. In this emerging society then took place all the system of the construction of social reality which is splendidly described by John Searle. But note the origin and the structure of society is independent from construction exactly like natural beings. Ah, this is Darwin and this is uh, the cave of Lascaux. Uh, the man that decided uh, of uh, putting these dots, uh, which is, uh, could be also considered uh, the origin of writing, the origin of money, the origin of whatsoever, was not intending in a clear way what he was doing. He was simply repeating some gestures and at the very end the result was society, language and so on and so forth. Exactly in a shorter time than in evolution. Um, and uh, we have in this sense a uh, developing uh, history from institution up to intention. I am, I am almost done. Uh, we have traces, rights, uh, miles, uh, money, 
writing, and on the very end, we have the society, the intention, what is clear, determined, and, uh, uh, and described in the construction of social reality. I would say that we are able to construct social objects, but the society is not at all, is not constructed, is emergent. This would be uh, the sample concentration of, uh, of, uh, of my point. Just a uh, uh, last uh, point. And if we don't have time, because uh, this uh, construction of social reality supposed that for construction we did, say, four billion years. But usually in social reality we have uh, not uh, such a big, uh, big time. Uh, I would say that uh, we have hands. Um, we have hands in the sense that much of what we do in social reality is not produced by clear intention, but mostly by actions. Actions and tools, of course. And this to sum up what we do with money. With money, with especially what, uh, uh, when I take these 10 euros and I give uh, to uh, uh, a barman asking for a coffee, I'm not uh, transferring uh, an uh, uh, economical theory from uh, my brain to the brain of uh, uh, the barman, the bartender. I am simply giving with a gesture uh, something to the barman. And uh, we don't need an intelligent design in order to have a design which is intelligent and this uh, more or less intelligent, and this uh, at the very end is uh, my intuition on social reality. Thank you very much. see any disagreement. He says, well, a lot of times you don't explicitly make a decision to create a social function. It emerges. I think that's right. Uh, but uh, it's a mistake to think, well, you got a choice. Either it emerges or it has to be a conscious decision. There are all kinds of intermediate cases. To me, the fascinating cases are where people create an institutional reality when they think they're doing something else. Uh, so, for example, there are a large number of people in my childhood who, who thought the American Constitution was divinely inspired. I mean, we couldn't have such a miraculous document without God's help. Well, I'm going to say we have the same document even if God didn't help. Uh, and also, uh, occasionally, I have been asked to lecture in the Vatican. It's wonderful. Um, I, if you're asked to lecture, I accept it immediately before they realize they made a mistake. 
uh, to invite me, uh, but uh, they have a conception of institutional reality that's quite different from mine, but it seems to work well. They, as far as I can tell, they don't think they got together and voted for the Pope. They did that, but the actual decision, that was made upstairs, right? Now, I want to say, even if they're wrong about that, it works, because the Pope has a status function. I met the guy, I shook his hand, I was told you're not supposed to shake his hand, but anyway, I told him he was a hell of a guy. This was the good Pope, not the present one, but our earlier Pope who was a good guy. Uh, anyway, so there are all kinds of cases uh, where uh, people have status functions and they don't know what's going on. Now, one of my favorites is money, because in the case of money, there are systematic sets of falsehoods that people routinely believe. Most people believe money is backed by something. It's not gold. Uh, a long time they believe that. Well, at least it's backed by the government. The truth is money isn't backed by anything. The only thing it's backing is collective intentionality. And it's an amazing fact. People will accept this stuff. Uh, when they stop accepting it, it stops functioning as money. Uh, so, but there are another of other mistakes about money. One is it must be backed by something. Uh, the other mistake is that an awful lot of money pretends to be a contract. On British currency to this day, it says the uh, treasurer of the Bank of England will pay the bearer 10 pounds on demand. What do you get? You go to the treasury. That treasurer, by the way, was an old uh, economics tutor of mine from Washington, absolutely hopeless as an economist, so they made him uh, treasurer of the Bank of England. Um, but in any case, what would you get? You give him 10 pounds, I want money. He'd give you another 10 pound note. There isn't anything else there. My favorite is Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, the illusions are removed. Bitcoin is backed by nothing. Why does it work? Well, because people know you can't cheat, or at least they think you can't cheat. You can't manipulate the supply of the currency. So what I'm interested in is, well, okay, there is are two separate questions. One question is, what do you introduce into social ontology when you introduce written language? And the answer is enormous power. You have all sorts of powers with writing that you don't have without writing. There's no question about that. But you can have social ontology without writing, because we know that human beings had it, literally, uh, for centuries and centuries before the invention of writing. Now, the invention of writing added enormous power, no question about that, but you can have, a friend of mine actually studies a tribe in the Amazon basin, uh, the Pitaha, and they have no writing. In fact, they don't even have what we would think is a very exciting language. They have no color words. They can't count. Uh, they can't say it's red. They, say, they can say it looks like blood, uh, but they cannot say it's red, and they can't count even up to two. They don't count. They just don't count at all. Uh, still, they have a social ontology. They have a, 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 a systems of state and function that are rather primitive. So you get interesting questions, and that is what, uh, what powers are introduced with written language, and there's no question, enormous powers are introduced. And the second is, what sorts of uh, distinctions do you need to make between what is actually happening from an institutional point of view and what do people believe is happening? Now, let me give you one of my favorite cases. A group of men in Philadelphia in 1776 got together. These men were not citizens of anything. They were the king's subjects. They were the subjects of George III and they got together, and I, you know, they obviously read my book because they did exactly what I said they should do. We declare, they said, they said they, we make a status function declarations that henceforth we are an independent nation. And then they gave pretty good, uh, impressive reasons for that. Okay, now what entitled them to do that? Nothing. They got away with it. Uh, I, now, they, it's true, to get away with it, they needed a war. Uh, with the British, and it wasn't until after the British defeat at Yorktown that the United States was really established, that it uh, actually was accepted. A status function will work if you can get people to accept it. Sometimes, as with the American Constitution, it took a war 
to get it accepted. And by the way, we wouldn't have won the war without help from the French. A lot of Americans have forgotten this fact, but in any case, the help from the French was essential to defeating the British. But in any case, the status function was accepted. Now that was imitated many, 80 years later in Richmond, when a bunch of men got together and, and said, let us start the Confederate States of America. They had a war, different result. They lost that war, no more Confederate States of America. Uh, so you have state of function sometimes that are very self-conscious uh, and quite explicit without any prior authorization. Nobody authorized the men in Philadelphia to create a separate nation, uh, but they did and they succeeded. So what we need, I think, is a taxonomy of the modes of creation and modes of existence of all of these things and it's a mistake, I think, to suppose, well, either it emerged or it was an intentional act. Both are possible. Thank you. So you gave us a context. Uh, and uh, now I just uh, got uh, Mauritius' objection on Amazonian uh, tribe and uh, leaving traces. Thank you. Uh, no, just uh, uh, two points. Uh, I, uh, uh, I know there is uh, this uh, huge objection. Uh, what about a society without writing? Yeah. But uh, are there really society without writing? Yeah. Because note that there are society with rights, with uh, poems, with uh, tattoos. Why, why, no, why do they need so many tattoos and uh, 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 bizarre uh, objects. Uh, I believe that uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss told that uh, uh, French Academia is the only civilized people that uh, should, can dress like a savage with all this uh, kind of, uh, 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 of ornaments. In a sense, they take the place of, uh, of the writing. Uh, during uh, the uh, Cultural Revolution in uh, China, they were not able to have uh, degrees uh, in the army, which is very uncomfortable in the army not to have the degree because I obey to you if you are my superior, but there are no evidence about your superiority. Why should I obey to you? And uh, the solution was to put one, two, three, four pence uh, here in order to say it's a corporal, it's a general, it's, uh, 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 so uh, if uh, we uh, take for writing a series of distinctive signs and iterating gestures, for instance, why usually in society without writing you have initiation rights, which are very uncomfortable for, for us. Uh, you don't need an initiation right in order to get your driving license. But uh, in order to become a hunter in uh, Amazonia, you need uh, an initiation right. That takes more or less, uh, and uh, often as, uh, uh, as physical traces on your body, that shows uh, your uh, your status. So this was just a, a, say an integration to the first point. Second point, I perfectly agree on the fact that uh, uh, there is not a contradiction between emergence and construction. Uh, the one does not exclude the other. But uh, what I just want to suggest uh, is that uh, or being in society looks much closer to learning the first language than to learn the second language. There is a gigantic difference from the first and the second because with the second you are aware that I am learning a language, I am doing this and this and this, whereas, and this is also the beginning of uh, your, uh, your book uh, on social reality, the most we do in social reality is an aware in a sense. We don't think, we don't know, and uh, uh, if we, we need to know, we were not able to act. I think I'll just leave it open to the floor, but there are some. Can I raise this? Yeah. Okay. I want to write something more. There's a tribe. 
Now, of course, well, what counts as writing? Is my shirt a form of writing? Well, it's symbolic. I don't know what it symbolizes. Middle class values, okay, because I wear it buttoned, not, not common in Berkeley. Um, uh, but uh, not everything that is symbolic is writing. Uh, what, we, what is interesting about writing is the capacity to give an inscribed representation of spoken sentences so that you get a complete representation of the, uh, of the conditions of satisfaction of a, a, a spoken sentence. Anyway, I, I, I want to open it to the floor. It shouldn't be just a conversation between Maurizio. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, John. Uh, what I hear is uh, a kind of, uh, uh, let's say, a conversation or a dialogue between, uh, um, between what you were uh, saying to us when you visited Bologna about Umberto Eco, and uh, there might be um, kind of a coordination between the semiotics and the philosophy of language. Yeah. Are we now speaking yeah. about the same thing, or well. not? Are we going to <laughs> huh? okay. talk about meaning, or not? But then... Uh, okay, uh, well, let me say a little bit about this. Uh, I just addressed a conference about Umberto Eco in Bologna, uh, to, well, Umberto died recently. Now the conference was quite, uh, slightly uh, ironic. Umberto declared in his will, there must be no conferences about my work for 10 years. That's a big mistake. There's no reason to suppose he's gonna be remembered in 10 years. Uh, so we had a conference now about Umberto, and everybody said, this is not a conference about Umberto, and now I will explain uh, Umberto's ideas, and I attack the idea that there is such a thing as semiotics. I think it rests on a mistake. It's a mistake common uh, to Peirce, uh, but it was a mistake that Frege avoided. Frege saw that the unit of meaning is not the word or the sign. The unit of meaning has to be an entire sentence because it has to represent an entire state of affairs. So that's what's wrong with semiotics, is they think the sign is a unit of meaning. It's not. It's entirely dependent on sentences. And the proof of this is very simple. Think of the favorite signs. Think of the symbols that have figured so largely in Europe, the hammer and sickle, uh, the swastika, the Hockenkoits, uh, or for that matter, the crucifix. How would you explain the meaning of these signs except by way of sentences? In order to understand the crucifix or the Hockenkoits or the hammer and sickle, a child has to have sentences. Sentences are the basic units. All the others are dependent on that. Thank you. Well, we need context. So in this, uh, in this context, uh, yeah. I invite you uh, for questions. Yes. I can agree and uh, completely understand that status functions are crucial and that declarations are uh, creating yeah. status functions. But what, what is at least as much as more important as that, I think, is to explain why some declarations succeed yeah. mm -hmm. in creating status functions. Because understand. there is a lot of them which yeah. do not succeed. So I think the crucial question is really what is the reason that some declarations succeed and some do not? Yeah. We have some. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, did some everybody, comments on that. Uh, did everybody hear the question? I think it's a terrific question. The basic question. I was supposing I'm right uh, that in fact human civilization is created by status function declarations or by representations that have that logical form. Why do some succeed and others do not? And I think if you have that, you have a theory of social change. And I don't have that. I mean, that's large. A lot of that is an empirical question for sociologists and economic, uh, economists and so on. The important thing to see, though, is it works if you get people to accept it. If you can get people to accept it, you have created a new status function. Uh, and what happened in the history of the United States is that in the end, people accepted it. It took more time than people realized 
It was not until after the Civil War that the expression the United States became a singular term. The United States is. Before that, people said the United States are because that was a plural subject. There were many different states and they were thought of as independent entities. So how do you create a unified United States? Well, it took four years of heavy fighting and it wasn't until, well, it wasn't until we surrendered uh, that it was really over. Who was that we? What? We. Who yeah. was that we? Yeah. Who surrendered? Uh, Lee. Uh, uh, we. Yeah, Lee. They, Sorry. The I Confederate States of America's Army of Northern Virginia, the most effective army in the war, by the way, surrendered uh, to a, a, an American general that we hope was sober on that occasion because he was only rarely sober. His name was Grant, and he later became president. But in any case, Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. to the discussion, and I think I agree with everything you said. And it is an amazing fact about human civilization that what seems absolutely natural to one generation seems absolutely ridiculous to the next generation. You will be surprised to discover that most of the girls that were my contemporaries did not want what we think of as complete equality uh, for women. They didn't want to have to go out and get a job. Now, I took uh, women profession for granted because my mother was a medical doctor at a time when there were practically zero medical doctors. She graduated from medical school in 1930. Now think how many women doctors were there in 1930. I went back to her medical school and looked at the photographs of all these great doctors. In this sea of male faces there are two women uh, in 1930. And my wife was uh, an attorney when there were very few women attorneys. So we gradually create a system of expectations where it seems perfectly normal. See, I was uh, 10 years old or more before I realized it was okay for men to be doctors. It seemed strange to me that a man would be a doctor because the a person I knew best as a doctor was my mother. Now it seems perfectly natural and I'm told, no, this is an amazing fact, most of the people in medical schools in the United States are female. That's hard to believe, but I think something like that has happened. So you get these gradual social changes where nobody's aware that a major shift is going on in the society about what constitutes a, a profession and what constitutes acceptable membership in a profession. Thank you. Maybe we can shift our uh, conversation towards the money. Uh, as, uh, as, uh, Did you want to translate what she said? No, I'm sorry. No, Go ahead. No, 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 no. It's okay. I just wanted to shift towards the money. The, yeah, the okay, money. money. Is our object. Yeah. But in any case, uh, please. 
Thanks. Yeah, I have one more general question about your wonderful talk. Um, you talked about the empty powers and yeah. that they give us reasons to act independent of our inclination. Exactly. Um, and that they're created by language, declaration, and so forth. Now, um, I would say that the only way the empty powers will work if, is there, if, they, if there are real world constraints to action that somehow a prohibition yeah. will work, if there's some kind of punishment, if you yeah. do engage in behavior and so forth. So couldn't you, in a sense, bypass language and say whenever there's a faculty to associate certain ter kinds of behaviors with real-world consequences, punishment, yeah. rewards, and so forth? Yeah, I don't think you can bypass language. Institutional reality. Yeah. See, uh, my doggies, I, I always appeal to them, are great doggies, uh, but I cannot get them to have a sense of their obligations. And the reason is they can't represent an obligation. What you do is train the doggie to want what you want him to want. But he has to train desires. Now, the remarkable thing about humans is you can get them to recognize their obligations in such a way that they will want to do something because it fulfills an obligation. But the obligation isn't itself a desire. It's desire independent. And that's a remarkable invention. Nietzsche saw that. He thought, saw the amazing thing about humans is they can make promises. And that's an amazing fact. We create a deontic reality by language. And so the, we, we need to understand more of this. We need to understand the role of language in the creation of a deontology. Just another more general question for you along the next topic. I was interested in the role of what you think the intentionality in sort of perpetuating some sort of social abstract, social concept, which is more abstract, such as like social hierarchy or symbolic capital. Because it has some sort of material object like I couldn't hear the question. Can you summarize? Say it louder. Can you just say it louder? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> the main point. Well, maybe somebody heard the question better than I did and can tell me what it was. I thought it was a very intelligent question. I could yes. tell that much, but what exactly? That's 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 I couldn't detect. My fault. I that's, had more that's a trick. Because, because it's intelligent, we should hear it once again. So, uh, Maurizio's leaving. I don't know how he gets away with this, but anyway. No, no, it's just a... <laughs> here, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's coming to... Now she's going to speak okay. over my... Uh, so I was wondering uh, about the role of collective intentionality in making social hierarchies. Yeah. So how do things which we may perceive that uh, not as group facts, not as concrete institutions, yeah. such as marriage, uh, how does society sort of attribute symbolic capital to certain things? How yeah. does something like polar shirt become a symbol of middle class belonging? Yeah. Or how do we sort of place things you know, on a scale of value? Uh, is it also a product of collective intentionality? So people implicitly agree that these things are such. And should we then assume that if we have a hierarchy which favors something over yeah. something else, that even those who are sort of closer to the less favored pole implicitly agree and comply with treating this as, as less favorable? Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, uh, uh, I, I think uh, the question is absolutely terrific, and I can only make very general, in, general and inadequate comments. It is characteristic of humans that everything they do symbolizes something beyond what they're doing. Uh, a shirt is never just a shirt, and a pair of shoes is never just a pair of shoes. And if you have doubts about that, think of the women, you know. It's clear that a pair of shoes is more than just a foot covering. It's a speech act. 
And what does it say? Well, let's look at the girl in her shoes and then we'll figure that out. So there's no question that this happens. Now, what you get in the case of human beings are an enormous, complex structure of status functions, which is more or less imperfectly reflected in language. I once lived in a community in Oxford which was extremely intelligent, but it did have practices which were quite unlike where I grew up in, in Chugwater, Wyoming, and Denver, Colorado. So for example, the fact that I thought females were attractive was regarded as a kind of intellectual limitation on my part. Uh, and I can remember people saying to me, but John, how could you possibly have a conversation with a woman? I think of it as the simplest sort of thing. Think of a conversation about Botticelli. You couldn't possibly have a conversation about Botticelli with a woman. This was a standard view in Oxford in my childhood, uh, where it was regarded as uh, women, <laughs> The fact that I like women was an intellectual limitation. It showed a failure of my sensibility. Now that's not true internationally. I doubt very much that it's true uh, in Rijeka, but it certainly was in certain parts of North Oxford. A preference for women was an intellectual and a cultural limitation. Uh, people forgave me because, you know, I grew up in America or something like that. Uh, so you get this enormous Baroque complexity in human relations, and they're constantly uh, changing. There's a uh, constant uh, fluidity. But I would like somebody, well, okay, you could say Goffman tried. Goffman tried to describe how human, human beings always are saying more than they're saying. Uh, there's always some additional uh, uh, symbolic representation in human life, and I think he may have been right, but he only scratched the surface. We need a much more elaborate characterization of that, and I hope you'll do it. I mean, that's your, think of that as your second book. Okay, I'll tell you your first book, because uh, you've already on, uh, well on the way with that one, but your second book ought to be about this very question, because it's a crucial question. Also, uh, satisfaction declaration. For example, yeah. the difference between uh, I thank you, John, for your wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, lecture, or for example, I baptize this uh, <coughs> sheep, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, don't you find there is a difference? Because in the first case, there is something that changed, but not really in the world. Something that changes the relationship to two persons. Yeah. In the second case. From that moment, the uh, sheep is Queen Elizabeth, is named Queen Elizabeth. So, uh, do you think there is a difference in the social institutional reality, depending on the of, uh, from the difference of uh, kinds of declarations? Yeah. Some which uh, works only, we could say, in the context. Some yeah. that works really in the world, yeah. uh, like uh, name, obligation. Well, if you think of human relationships, it's clear that some of them are created by explicit declarations. A formally performed marriage in the societies I'm familiar with is kind of a big deal speech act. It often is done in church or it's done in front of a registry and it is, I'm sorry, Maurizio is near because it has to be written down. You have to be able to show a marriage certificate. But in addition to that, there are all kinds of complex relationships which are long-term friendships, for example, and that's a status function. You, I, 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 you have an obligation uh, to somebody as a friend. Uh, Paolo and I have been friends for many years, and this is a status function. You have this, and it's part of uh, you know, uh, the, the social organization that many such status functions are created quite informally. They need not ever be written down. Sort of, you know, here, I wear these dumb things and it doesn't actually work, but I, I, I pay a lot of money for it, so I think it's supposed to work. Thank you. So more formal than I would like to be. 
but... Uh, yeah, okay. you want to use this one? Oh, anyway, you're all... <laughs> The question is actually about the emergent yeah. stuff. So the, the theory of emergence, as uh, I think I understand it from you, has this uh, bottom-up and top-down kind of characteristics. Yeah, I love so, these metaphors. Okay. Yeah, I love them. Bottom-up. So, Here we yeah, go. Yeah. So in terms of uh, what comes next, uh, or what, what is first, what comes next, is really relevant in the sense of dynamics of the system. So I'm uh, wondering, <coughs> maybe there is some things in this status function uh, which emerges from this uh, stupid uh, organizational, as they call it, it's kind of uh, natural, biological stuff emerging to yeah. some kind of cognitive thing and then it turns to identification or identity of stuff and then we come to the language as a, uh, as a function of interaction of, uh, with, it, with each other. But then it feeds back to the old, old things uh, which was previously thought of as bottom, bottom yeah. thing. And uh, I would suggest that maybe this could be also integrated in your uh, yeah. uh, stuff. So you will integrate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, no, no, I love these questions. So let me expand on uh, that one. Uh, it's clear uh, that a lot of status functions grow bottom up out of natural human relations. So you have uh, people living together and producing babies. Uh, that is the first step towards marriage and family. You have a natural form of social relationship, pair bonding, as the biologists call it, and that is very easy to see how that leads to marriage, how you go from pair bonding to obligations. Okay, now another a set of, of a social relations that's bottom up is property. So the guy owns the clothing on his body and he owns his hut but you don't yet have a system of private property, but it's easy to see how it develops. Now, the amazing thing about human beings is that they then evolve systems of status function that don't have a natural basis. And the most fantastic is money. Uh, and I'm sorry we didn't talk more about it because it is an amazing status function. And as far as I can tell, it only works because people don't understand it. Uh, if they understood it, it would be much harder for it to work. So, for example, most people believe money is backed by something. In my childhood, it was backed by the gold in Fort Knox. There isn't enough gold, and it's ridiculous. Most of the gold gets its value in relation to money. So this is a $20 gold piece, people say. But nobody ever says, well, uh, this uh, a $20 bill is a half an ounce of a bill. No, you measure things in money including gold. But in any case, there was a systematic deception involved in uh, money, and that was it's backed by something. And now this goes on. I told you it says on the 10-pound note that the treasurer of the Bank of England will pay you 10 pounds, but there isn't anything he can pay you with. And this is why, like Bitcoin, the illusions are removed. In Bitcoin, it's not backed by anything. It works because you can't cheat. Uh, with Bitcoin, as, as governments can cheat with actual currency. They can manipulate the supply of currency for political reasons, but Bitcoin cannot in that way be manipulated. I'll be interested to see how long it can survive, because it's plainly not backed by anything. But there is a the systematic deception. Now, one of the greatest deceptions in money is it has to be digital. You can't just say, well, this costs more money than that. You have to say, how much exactly? So you have the illusion that if you have, a, let me boast here, that if you have a hundred euro note, then you've actually got a hundred of something. But you don't. You don't have a hundred of anything. What you have is deontic power. And the deontic power is strictly a matter of the price level. So if the price is double, your power went down by half. But you have to have the illusion that I have a hundred of something. That's an illusion. You don't have a hundred of anything. You got some money, and a hundred is more than fifty. But there's no entity such that you have a hundred of them. So there are a whole lot of deceptions about money. And economists, when I tell them this, they don't seem eager to hear it. We knew that all along. We knew that all along. Yeah. Then why did you, why, when I studied economics in Oxford, why did nobody tell me the deceptions inherent in money? I wrote an article called "Money and Deception," where I try to list all the deceptions involved in money, and those are are three massive deceptions. 
One is it's backed by something. A second is it's digital that you've actually got uh, something when you've got a hundred of it. And then there's a third colossal deception uh, that the amount of money somehow or other is fixed uh, by some rational means. It's not. Uh, the banks create money every day by loaning money they don't have. And uh, we couldn't, the economy couldn't work if banks didn't create money on this one. Anyway, there are other deceptions, but those are three. Thank you. You spontaneously uh, took us to uh, not only talking about money, but uh, what I wanted to ask you about Trump. How come that uh, a guy who uh, declared bankruptcy for so many times and uh, who uh, is, uh, let's say, he's rich, he's very yeah. powerful, uh, his status yeah. uh, is uh, indisputable in this yeah. sense, how, how come is it he uh, became uh, um, yeah, you're holding United it. You want me president. to answer that question? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you uh, no, to What, to what I love is when you go to Europe, everybody holds me personally responsible for Donald Trump. How <laughs> could <laughs> you have done this to us? <laughs> Among other voters. <laughs> no, I have to tell you, so far, Trump is a triumph of the American constitutional system because it turns out he can't do anything. The only he's got one guy appointed to the Supreme Court, but so far he hasn't been able to pass health care legislation. He, has, he hasn't lowered taxes. And what happens is the founding fathers of the United States were terrified that a Trump might become president. So they made sure the system would prevent him from doing much of anything. The sheer inertial force of Washington the sheer monstrous inertial power of the uh, uh, system of status functions which barely moves at all under any circumstances, that is constraining Trump. Now we have a great advantage with Trump in that he's not a European. He's not a Hitler or a Mussolini or even a Tito and that is, he has no real agenda. See, Hitler wanted something. He wanted Lebensraum in the East. But in that way, Trump doesn't know what he wants. You know, he likes being president, he hopes he makes a lot of money at it. Uh, we don't know how much money he has, but probably none as he pretends, because he's a colossal liar, and he's been lying all along. But so far, he hasn't done much damage, and I don't see how he can, uh, because the system will constrain him. So the Founding Fathers got it right. Design the system so you can't do much of anything. Now, two presidents fought against the system and extended the powers. Roosevelt and Barack Obama extended the powers of the presidency in ways that are not uh, imagined by the constitutional founders. They gave the president more power than he should have, and Trump has been Which using that. Trump. Uh, and he may be extending the power. So we have so far resisted an executive government. Uh, we've, uh, ex uh, we have resisted a dictatorial executive in a way that European societies did not resist it. We'll see how far Trump can go in extending the power. But so far, it's been pretty harmless. So you're saying that uh, Obama is somehow responsible? Well, pardon me. Obama Trump. extended the power of the executive in ways that are clearly unconstitutional. He couldn't get Congress to pass legislation that gave him what he wanted in the field of uh, 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 deporting uh, immigrants and allowing them to stay. So he did it by executive order. Now there's nothing really that allows him in the Constitution to make legislative decisions like that by executive order. But he got away with it and people went along with it because they thought, well, it's a good thing to do. That's same with Roosevelt. But the difficulty is when you mess with the Constitution, you pay a price later on. And this is what happened in the both of case, the Roosevelt and Obama, is they extended the power of the executive in ways that are potentially quite dangerous. Very much. Uh, I just have one small detail, which is. Watch out, guys, one small detail. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's just that I do not agree that money isn't backed by anything. I think uh, what I mean is that I'm pretty certain that money is backed by military power. If United States dollars had not backed it with nukes and tanks, it would really be worthless. 
Yeah. And you see that anytime, you know, if, if you just look at the Middle East and the yeah. questions of, uh, you know, exchanging dollar for euro uh, by Saddam Hussein yeah. and there are other entities, yeah. you can see that, you know, uh, the idea of military power backing yeah. the dollar is enormous. So well, I do not agree that money is uh, money is uh, not backed by anything. And secondly, secondly, Bitcoin is a is a, comp a much more Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, is a more complex thing. But I would still agree that I would still uh, insist that it is backed by something, namely what? by the U.S. dollar. By the because dollar. Bitcoin only yes. exists. Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a parasitic yeah. currency. It doesn't exist in itself. It only yeah. exists if you invest U.S. dollar yeah. or euro. China, whatever. Okay. So if you put money that is backed by military power. Yeah. So I would, you know, this is just a small little fragmented <laughs> thing, but I would say that money is backed yeah. by something. If it's not by God who invested Definitely the king not. in their power, then it's invested by, 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 by uh, military power. Just okay. Okay. <laughs> this is just a small, a small yeah. thing. No, I, 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 I'm grateful for the contribution. I don't think it's right. Uh, let me say that. Um, I, in 1971, I made a shrewd decision. I bought some Swiss francs. I even opened a bank account in Basel. And the Swiss naturally assume you're a criminal. And they said, don't worry, Professor Searle, we won't tell any government <laughs> agency. I can tell anybody I like. I'm not trying to cheat anybody. I just want some Swiss francs. Don't worry, Professor Searle, we have complete uh, uh, confidentiality. So the Swiss assumed you wanted to commit some crime and they were wanting to help you to commit the crime. Uh, and the upshot of that was that the Swiss rank was pretty good. But it was not because the Swiss Air Force was flying overhead or anything like that. The Swiss had a, I had a bad joke of an army. It meant uh, people went away on their summer vacation and marched around carrying guns for a while. But they don't have an army uh, uh, worth much of anything. I'm sorry Swiss are, are offended by that. But in any case, the Swiss currency was very valuable at a time when the Swiss had no military power to speak of. And now the French. Uh, sometimes the French currency is valuable, but the French military is largely a joke and has, uh, has, has been a, not a serious uh, international force since 19, well, 1918, really. And Bitcoin? The question of Bitcoin? Uh, Bitcoin. Well, all I want to say about Bitcoin is that, it's, uh, yes, of course, he says it's backed by the United States dollar. Well, yes, right. You can. I, uh, uh, if you got Bitcoin, you can sell it for dollars and you can buy it for dollars. But that's true of Swiss francs and, German, and uh, euros and all sorts of other things. Uh, so they, the point is that Bitcoin is not backed by some uh, gold in the Bitcoin bank or anything like that. I, I like that because it reveals the fact that Bitcoin works because it's accepted. One form of the acceptance is you can change it for dollars or euros or any other currency. and on money. So language is very useful for people to understand each other. But it seems to me that it also produces such things as wars, for example. Uh, similarly for money, uh, there are these crashes. <laughs> Some people are, are telling us in, in this year there will be, uh, I mean, the system will go down. You have some explanation for such? Yeah. Such okay. Well, all right. Now, uh, I didn't really talk about uh, the role of language, except for this one area, namely, language is essential to the creation and maintenance of institutional reality. I talked about the creation of the maintenance figures as well. So, for example, uh, any revolutionary movement tries to get control of the vocabulary. In the early days of feminism, they were very anxious to get rid of the terminology of ladies and gentlemen because it marked status functions that they wanted to abolish. But there are other roles of language that are need to be discussed. One is language plays a constitutive role where the emotions are concerned. Uh, La Oshuko says very few people would ever fall in love if they never read about it. And you'd have to add enough, they never saw it on television or in the movies or anything like that. So the representation, the linguistic representation of the emotion becomes partly constitutive of the emotion. And I think that's true of all kinds of emotional states, is you learn how to have the emotion from reading literature and hearing it described and seeing it on television or seeing it in the movies. You, 
you acquire a set of scenarios that surround different emotional states. And much of our literature is about the de development of emotions, and I think that's linguistic. So when I say language is constitutive of institutional reality, I don't mean that's the only constitutive thing. I think it does all kinds of things with love and hate and jealousy and envy and rivalry and so on. Language is constitutive of all sorts of emotional phenomena. So my doggy is a very good doggy, but he can't fall in love. You've got to have a certain kind of linguistic capacity to fall in love, and he doesn't have that. I think it may be helpful to uh, talk about this backing by. Uh, money is backed by something. Yeah. I, I think we, we should, uh, maybe it will be in accordance with your, your views and against uh, yeah. what we, we just heard. Uh, uh, we can think about back by in two ways. Well, one way is uh, backed by some good, you know, some gold or, yeah. or the, the domestic product yeah. of, the, of the state or something like that. Well, but I think this is the sense in which money is not backed by anything. Yeah. But there is another, another way which I, I think you could agree with, and this is that uh, when we say money is backed by something, that it means, well, the acceptance of money yeah. is backed by something. Yeah. So I would say, well, the, the, the fact that the uh, US dollar is accepted as a, as a money, not just in the United States, but in all of the world, as a, yeah. as a, uh, a world, world currency, is, yeah. is backed up by the state or something mm -hmm. like that. Or if you think there is no, there is no money, I think that every, every state uh, which is backing up their money, uh, it obliges you to pay the taxes in the money. So, and this is the backing up, but I would say in this second phase, it's backing the acceptance of money, not yeah. the money by itself. So yeah. I can think we can make this distinction and to understand what we are talking about. Here. Okay, no, again, I'm grateful for this. The point about talking about backing was this. Traditionally, it was felt something is only money because some, there's something in addition to the money from which it derives its value. Now the idea was, uh, in the case of contract money, it said uh, that a state will pay, the, will pay the bearer $20 in gold. So you could go and then they would give you a gold up to the value of $20. And that was uh, the, the sense in which the money was backed by something. It turns out that's largely an illusion. Uh, even under the gold standard, there isn't enough gold to go around. And now, uh, there, there's, in the textbooks, there are three accounts. There's commodity money, where a valuable commodity like gold is used as money. There's contract money, where it, it's money only in virtue of the fact that it's a contract to pay you in gold. And then there's fiat money, which is supposed to be money just because somebody says it's money. A status, what I would call status function money. And basically the claim I'm making is all money is status function money. It's all status function. It's not backed by anything in this sense. Now you want to say, yeah, but there has to be a network of banks and a means of exchange. And I agree that it is a kind of backing, but it's not what the original theorists meant. See, money is an amazing status function. And yet, it, how does it work? Well, it does work. And one of the reasons it works is nobody seems to understand it. They don't understand why it works. Certainly economists don't. Thank you. So, uh, what I would like now to uh, um, state is maybe this triangular form from your book, because when you were talking about money, you also talked about borders and you also talked about properties. Yeah. So it is a, a kind yeah. of a triangular. Uh, well, it isn't form. just triangular, but there's a whole network. Yes. Of course. You have money because you can buy things with it. But when you buy things with it, you trade money for something else, and now you have the owning powers over to something else. You have uh, the car that you bought or the property. Yeah. <coughs> so money is involved in a heavy and complex network of, of uh, the owning powers, and it gets its functions within that complex network. I quite mm -hmm. agree. <coughs> and and uh, how are you going to relate this to the property? Yeah, well, OK. The whole notion of private property is a status function. So my doggy has his bone, and other doggies have their bones, but they don't yet have the concept of private property because they don't have a deontology. 
Now we have elaborate systems of private property based on deontology, based on property rights. And these have undergone enormous changes over the uh, past centuries. Uh, uh, for uh, people in Britain, most property that you buy is not freehold. What you buy is a hundred year lease. That would seem crazy to Americans. When you buy a piece, when you buy a house in the United States, you buy a permanent forever right to the house. But in Britain, that's not common. Uh, what you get is a hundred year lease. And, that's, and then uh, the lease loses its value every year, but the inflation uh, overcomes that. So after 70, after 30 years, you sell a 70 year lease from more than you paid for it when it was a hundred year lease. So there are different ways that societies have of coping. Uh, with property, and the American way is, I think, intuitively more obvious. Americans have the illusion, it's my property, so I have an absolute right to it. Now, of course, you don't. All It's constrained in all kinds of ways. I can't build a factory on my property in Berkeley because the neighborhood doesn't allow for it. It's a heavily zoned. There are heavy restrictions on construction uh, and all sorts of other things. I mean, the property values vary with things like the school qualities, even though you have no control over them. And then uh, we're coming to borders, because borders, uh, yeah. uh, if we think of them now, uh, as always, yeah. uh, uh, there are some that can cross these borders and they're yeah. accepted, and uh, some are not accepted, not only in uh, here in Europe or in the United States. Yeah. So uh, why I wanted to introduce this equality. Uh, oh, equality. We didn't yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, that. Exactly through uh, your steps, yeah. through uh, money, borders, property. Uh, so how we are going to deal with this yeah. kind well, of okay. social reality and then influence uh, into a social change? How we are I, going I to think deal once with you it? get the idea of human rights, uh -huh. and it's, it's an amazing idea because the old notion of rights was always tied to a particular institution. You had a right as a landowner, you had a right uh, as a baron against the king. Uh, Magna Carta was about the rights of the aristocracy against the king. But some genius got the idea there are rights that you have just in virtue of being human. Now, I think that implies the notion of equal rights because we're all equally human beings. Then you have to do a special kind of intellectual gyration to say, well, some people are not fully human. You know, they're black, they're Jews, or something like that. And then you have to deny that they're real human beings, and that's awkward, and you're in, in an intellectual mind when you do that. So I think implicit in the notion of human rights is the notion of equal rights. It's false, obviously, to say all people are in fact equal, but the, 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 uh, the, the intellectual content of the claim is that, that all the people are equal, is they're all entitled to equal rights. They all have equal ground for claiming human rights. That's the basic idea. Well, okay, I have a lot more to say about a whole lot of other issues, but I'm, I think this issue about money is important. Uh, money is the ultimate status function in that it doesn't, it's not grounded in anything other than money. And the, uh, the idea that money is backed by or grounded in something, that the natural form of money is gold, uh, that's a, a deep mistake. Uh, there isn't enough gold to go around, and even under the gold standard, uh, the amount of gold in circulation was always much less than the amount of currency, the amount of money in circulation. Money works because people accept it. The problem is, often they accept it for wrong reasons. Uh, they think it works because it's backed by something. The United States Army, that's what backs our money. No, the United States Army doesn't back the money. The fall of the dollar in 1971 that led me to buy uh, Swiss francs had nothing to do with the weakness of the army. The army was as strong as ever. And it had to do with things like balance of payments problems. So money is terrifying in a way because it matters so much to us and yet it's ungrounded. It's just there and we accept it because we accept it. And here is its unique feature. Money is the only thing that has its trait. Money is believed to be valuable. Money is valuable because it's believed to be valuable. But everybody believes it's valuable 
because and only because they believe everybody else believes it's valuable and believes that everybody else believes that everybody believes that it's valuable and so up in one of these infinite but harmless hierarchies. So money is the ultimate status function in the, because it's immensely powerful and very valuable, but it's only valuable because people believe that everybody believes that it's valuable. And if you can get people to stop believing it's valuable, it ceases to be valuable. I have some Confederate currency. It's hilarious to read it, what it says on Confederate currency. It says, the Confederate States of America will pay the bearer $10. It's a $10 bill. What are they going to give you? But not like American currency that said it will pay you $10 now. It said they'll pay you $10 after the cessation of hostilities and a peace treaty is signed between the Confederate States of America and the United States of America. Never going to happen. Never did happen. So the Confederate currency, like all money, was based on a fantasy. But in the case of the Confederate currency, the fantasy was de demonstrated to be false very quickly, within four years. And how we are going to change status functions? Now, well, what how they do? change, you see, that's what we were, uh, that's uh, what she's going to write her third book about, is uh, social change. Uh, and this, I think, is a crucial question, because it, they are changing all the time. Uh, and we don't understand the mechanisms of the change. Why did the sociologists let us down so badly? What are the results of sociology that we're all relying on? I never got anything from those guys. Uh, but in any case, this is what we need more work on. We more, need more work on, so to speak, uh, the logical ontology of human society, and that's what I've been trying to do here. Mm. And can, can you tell us then more uh, between the uh, contract and statues? Yeah. Uh, how, because contract somehow has been introduced yeah. uh, to, uh, to make it better. To well, the idea it was, it seems statues. kind of intuitive. First, there's gold, and that's money because it's valuable. But then, it's pretty inefficient to carry gold around. You don't want gold, so you give these people sheets of paper that say, we'll pay the bearer in gold. So there's a guy who sits on a bench called a bank, and he's called a banker, and he sits there and he gives you these sheets of paper for the gold, and then you take him a sheet of paper and he'll give you gold. Now what happens inevitably is there's more paper than there is gold. More sheets of paper are issued. It's just irresistible. They issue more sheets of paper than you have gold. And that works until suddenly everybody wants the gold at once, then the whole system collapses, and that's what happened over and over. Then finally some genius got the idea, forget about the gold and just have the sheets of paper. That's the situation we're in now. But people find that very uncomfortable. You mean, that's all I have is a sheet of paper on which it says that it's 10 euros? That's all there is, and that's it. That's all you have. And it works because people, well, as I told you, people think it's valuable because they think everybody else thinks it's valuable, think everybody else thinks that everybody else thinks it's valuable, and so on. And it does seem to work. And when we go out and buy lunch, we'll find it works even today, even in Rijeka, even in the era of Trump. It will continue to work. Thank you.